Welcome to my humble abode, darlings. Come in out of the rain and get comfortable. I have a story to tell you, and I hope you enjoy. If you do, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hello, darlings. I am starting a new series today, and I, I have landed on the island of Dr. Moreau because that really creeped me out on a level that I wasn't used to when I was young. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. We'll see how it goes. If it's very unpopular, I will probably drop it. Um, so let me know your thoughts on it after this first episode, and we'll see how it goes from there. Anyway, darlings, I present to you H.G. Wells, The Island of Dr. Moreau. Introduction. On February the 1st, 1887, the Lady Vane was lost by collision with a derelict when about the latitude 1 degree south and longitude 107 west. On January the 5th, 1888, that is, 11 months and 4 days after, my uncle, Edward Predick, a private gentleman, who certainly went aboard the Lady Vane at Callow, and who had been considered drowned, was picked up in latitude 5 degrees 3 south and longitude 101 west, in a small open boat of which the name was illegible, but which is supposed to have belonged to the missing schooner, Epicake Anoas. He gave us such a strange account of himself that he was supposed demented. Subsequently, he alleged that his mind was blank from the moment of his escape from the Lady Vane. His case was discussed among psychologists at the time as a curious instance of the lapsed memory consequence upon physical and mental stress. The following narrative was found among his papers by the undersigned, his nephew and heir, but unaccompanied by any defined request for publication. The only island known to exist in the region in which my uncle was picked up is Noble's Isle, a small volcanic islet, and uninhabited. It was visited in 1891 by HMS Scorpion, a party of sailors then landed, and found nothing living thereon except curious white moths, some hogs and rabbits, and some rather peculiar rats, so that this narrative is without confirmation in its most essential particular. With that understood, there seemed no harm in putting this strange story before the public, in accordance, as I believe, with my uncle's intentions. There is at least this much. In its behalf, my uncle passed out of human knowledge about latitude five degrees south, and longitude 105 east, and reappeared in the same part of the ocean after a space of eleven months. In some way he must have lived during the interval, and it seems that a schooner called the Epicaricus was a drunken captain. John Davies did start from Africa with a puma and certainly other animals aboard in January 1887 that the vessel was well known at several ports in the South Pacific, and that it finally disappeared from those seas, with a considerable amount of copra aboard, sailing to its unknown fate from Baina in December 1887, a date that tallies entirely with my uncle's story. Charles Edward Prendick Chapter 1 in the dinghy of the Lady Vane. I do not propose to add anything to what has already been written concerning the loss of the Lady Vane. As everyone knows, she collided with a derelict when ten days out from Kalo. The longboat, with seven of the crew, was picked up eighteen days after by H.M. Gunboat Myrtle, and the story of their terrible privation has become quite as well known as the far more horrible Medusa case. But I have to add to the published story of the Lady Vane another 
possibly as horrible and far stranger. It has hitherto been supposed that the four men who were in the dinghy perished, but this is incorrect. I have the best evidence for this assertion. I was one of the four men. But in the first place, I must state that there was never four men in the dinghy. The number was three. Constance, who was seen by the captain to jump into the gig, luckily for us and unluckily for him, did not reach us. He came down out of a tangle of ropes under the stays of the smashed bowsprite. Some small rope caught his heel as he let go, and he hung for a moment head down, and then fell and struck a block or spare floating in the water. We pulled towards him, but he never came up. Daily News, March 17, 1887 I say lucky for us he did not reach us, and I might almost say luckily for him, for we only had a small beaker of water and some sodden ship biscuits with us. So sudden had been the alarm, so unprepared the ship for any disaster. We thought the people of the launch would be better provisioned, though it seemed they were not, and we tried to hail them, though they could not have heard us, and the next morning when the drizzle cleared, which was not until past midday, we could see nothing of them. We could not stand up to look about us, because of the pitching of the boat. The two other men who had escaped thus far with me were a man named Helmar, a passenger like myself, and a seaman whose name I don't know, a short, sturdy man with a stammer. We drifted famishing, and after our water had come to an end, tormented by the intolerable thirst. For eight days altogether, after the second day the sea subsided slowly to a glassy calm, it's quite impossible for the ordinary reader to imagine those eight days. He has not, luckily for himself, anything in his memory to imagine with. After the first day we said little to one another, and lay in our places on the boat, and stared at the horizon, or watched with eyes that grew larger and more haggard every day, the miserable and weakness gaining upon our companions. The sun became pitiless, the water ended on the fourth day, and we were already thinking strange things, and saying them with our eyes, but it was, I think, the sixth, before Helmar gave his voice to the thing we had all been thinking. I remember our voices were dry and thin so that we bent towards one another and spared our words. I stood out against it with all my might, was rather for scuttling the boat and perishing together among the sharks than follow us. But when Helmar said that if his proposal was accepted, we should have drink, the sailor came round to him. I would not have drawn lots, however, and in the night the sailor whispered to Helmar again and again, and I sat in the bows with my clasp knife in my hand, though I doubt if I had the stuff in me to fight. And in the morning I agreed to Helmar's proposal, and we handed halfpence to find the odd man. The lot fell upon the sailor, but he was the strongest of us and would not abide by it, and attacked Helmar with his hands. They grappled together and almost stood up. I crawled along the boat to them, intending to help Helmar by grasping the sailor's legs. But the sailor stumbled with the swaying of the boat, and the two fell upon the gunwale and rolled overboard together. They sank like stones. I remember laughing at that and wondering why I laughed. The laugh caught me suddenly like a thing from without. I lay across one of the thwarts for I know not how long, thinking that if I had the strength I would drink seawater and madden myself to die quickly. And even as I lay there I saw, with no more interest than if it had been a picture, a sail come up towards me over the skyline. My mind must have been wandering. And yet I remembered all that had happened, quite distinctly. I remember how my head swayed with the sea, and how the horizon with the sails above it danced up and down. But I also remember, as distinctly as I had, a, a persuasion that I was dead, and that I thought what a chest it was that they should come too late by such a little to catch me in my body. 
For an endless period, as it seemed to me, I lay with my head on the thwart watching the schooner. She was a little ship, schooner rigged fore and aft, come up out of the sea. She kept tacking to and fro in a widening compass, for she was sailing dead into the wind. I never entered my head to attempt to attract attention. I do not remember anything distinctly after the sight of her side, until I found myself in a little captain aft. There's a dim memory of being lifted up to the gangway and of a big round countenance, covered with freckles and surrounded with red hair staring at me over the bulkward. I also had a disconnected impression of a dark face with extraordinary eyes, close to mine, but I thought was a nightmare until I met it again. I fancy I recall some stuff being poured in between my teeth. And that is all. Chapter 2 The Man Who Was Going Nowhere The cabin in which I found myself was small and rather untidy. A youngish man with flaxen hair, a bristly straw-colored mustache, and a dropping nether lip was sitting and holding my wrist. For a minute we stared at each other without speaking. He had watery gray eyes, oddly void of expression, then just overheard came a sound, like an iron bedstead being knocked about, and the low, angry growling of some large animal. At the same time, the man spoke. He repeated his question. How do you feel now? I think I said I felt all right. I could not recall how I got there. He must have seen the question in my face, for my voice was inaccessible to me. You were picked up in a boat, starving. The name on the boat was Lady Vane, and there were spots of blood on the gunwale. At the same time, my eyes caught my hand, so thin that it looked like a dirty skin purse full of loose bones, and that the business of the boat came back to me. Have some of this, he said, and gave me a dose of some scarlet stuff, iced. It tasted like blood and made me feel stronger. You are in luck, he said, to get picked up by a ship with a medical man aboard. He spoke with a slobbering articulation, with the ghost of a lisp. What ship is this? I asked slowly, hoarse from my long silence. It's a trader from Arik and Callio. I never asked where she came from in the beginning, out of the lands of born fools, I guess. I'm a passenger myself from Arika. The silly ass who owns her, his captain too, named Davis. He lost a certificate or something. You know the kind of man calls the thing the Impecricana, <laughs> of all silly infernal names. Though when there was much of a sea without any wind, she certainly acts accordingly. Then the noise overhead began again, a snarling growl and the voice of a human being together. Then another voice telling some heaven-forsaken idiot to desist. You were nearly dead, says my interlocutor. It was a very near thing indeed, but I've put some stuff into you now. Notice your arms sore. Injections. You've been insensible for nearly thirty hours. I thought slowly. I was distracted now by the yelping of a number of dogs. Am I eligible for solid foods? I asked. Thanks to me, he said. Even now the mutton is boiling. Yes, I said with assurance. I could eat some mutton. But, he said with a moment's hesitation, you know I'm dying to hear how you came to be alone on that boat. Damn that howling, I thought, detecting some certain suspicion in his eyes. He suddenly left the cabin and I heard him in violent controversy with someone who seemed to me to talk gibberish in response to him. The matter sounded as though it ended in blows, but in that I thought my ears were mistaken. Then he shouted at the dogs and returned to the cabin. Well, he said in the doorway, you were just beginning to tell me. I told him my name, Edward Prendick, and how I had taken to natural history as a relief from the dullness of my comfortable independence. He seemed interested in this. I've done some science myself. 
I did my biology at university college. Getting the ovary of the earthworm and the radia of the snail and all that. <laughs> Lord, it's been ten years ago, but I go on. Go on. Tell me about the boat. He was evidently satisfied with the frankness of my story, which I told in concise sentences enough, for I felt horribly weak. And when it was finished, he reverted once again to the topic of natural history and his own biological studies. He began to question me closely about the Tottingham Court Road and Gower Street. It's Caplazzi still flourishing? What shop that was. He had evidently been a very ordinary medical student and drifted incontinently to topic of music halls. He told me some anecdotes. Left it all, he said, ten years ago. How jolly it all used to be. But I made a young ass of myself. Played myself out before I was twenty-one. I dare say it's all different now, but I must look up that ass of a cook and see what he's done to your mutton. The growling overhead was renewed so suddenly and with so much savage anger that it startled me. What's that? I called after him. But the door had closed. He came back again with the boiled mutton, and I was so excited by the appetizing smell of it that I forgot the noise of the beast that had troubled me. After a day of alternate sleep and feeding, I was so far recovered as to be able to get from my bunk to the scuttle and see the green sea trying to keep pace with us. I judged the schooner was running before the wind. Montgomery, that was the name of the flaxen-haired man, came in again as I stood there and asked him for some clothes. He lent me some duck things of his own for those... I had worn in the boat had been thrown overboard. They were rather loose for me, for he was large and long in his limbs. He told me casually that the captain was three parts drunk in his own cabin. As I assumed the clothing, I began asking him some questions about the destination of the ship. He said the ship was bound to Hawaii, but that it had to land him first. Where? I said. It's an island where I live. So far as I know, it hasn't got a name. He stared at me with his nether lip drooping and looked so wistfully stupid of a sudden that it came into my head that he desired to avoid my questions. I had the discretion to ask no more. Chapter 3 The Strange Face We left the cabin and found a man at the companion obstructing our way. He was standing on the ladder with his back to us, peering over the combing of the hatchway. He was, I could see, a misshapen man, short, broad, and clumsy, with a crooked back, a hairy neck, and a head sunk between his shoulders. He was dressed in dark blue serge and had a particularly thick, coarse black hair. I heard the unseen dogs howl furiously, and forthwith he ducked back. Coming into contact with the hand I put out to fend him off from myself, he turned with animal swiftness. Some indefinable way, the black face thus flashed upon me, shocked me profoundly. It was singularly deformed one. The facial part projected, forming something dimly suggestive of a muzzle, and the half-open mouth showed as big white teeth as I had ever seen in a human mouth. His eyes were bloodshot at the edges, with scarcely a rim of white round the hazel pupils. There was a curious glow of the excitement in his face. Confound you, said Montgomery. Why the devil don't you get out of the way? The black-faced man started aside without a word. I went on up the companion, staring at him instinctively as I did so. Montgomery stayed at the foot of for a moment. You have no business here, you know he said in a deliberate tone. Your place is forward. The black-faced man cowered. They, they won't have me forward, he spoke slowly with a queer, hoarse quality in his voice. Won't have you forward, said Montgomery in a menacing voice, but I tell you to go. He was on the brink of saying something further, then looked up at me suddenly and followed me up the ladder. I had paused halfway through the hatchway, looking back, 
still astonished beyond measure at the grotesque ugliness of his black-faced creature, yet I had never beheld such a repulsive and extraordinary face before. And yet, if the contradiction is credible, I experienced at the same time an odd feeling that in some way I had already encountered exactly the features and gestures that now amazed me. Afterwards, it occurred to me that I had probably seen him as I was lifted aboard, and yet that scarcely satisfied my suspicion of a previous acquaintance. Yet how could one have set eyes on so singular a face and yet have forgotten the precise occasion past my imagination? Montgomery's movement to follow me released my attention, and I turned and looked about me at the flush deck of the little schooner. I was already half prepared by the sounds I had heard for what I saw. Certainly I never beheld the deck so dirty. It was littered with scraps of carrot, shreds of green stuff, and indescribable filth. Fastened by chains to the main mast were a number of grisly staghounds, who now began leaping and barking at me, and by the mizzen of a huge puma who was cramped in a little iron cage far too small even to give it room to turn. Farther, under the starboard barkward, were some big hutches containing a number of rabbits, and a solitary llama was squeezed in a mere box of a cage forward. The dogs were muzzled by leather straps. The only human being on deck was a gaunt and silent sailor at the wheel. The patched and dirty spankers were tense before the wind, and up loft the little ship seemed carrying every sail she had. The sky was clear. The sun went midway down the western sky. Long waves capped by the breeze with froth were running with us. We went past the steersman to the traffrel and saw the water come foaming under the stern and the bubbles go dancing and vanishing in her wake. I turned and surveyed the unsavory length of the ship. Is this an ocean menagerie? I asked. <laughs> Looks like it, said Montgomery. What are these beasts for? Merchandise? Curios? Does the captain think he's going to sell them somewhere in the South Sea? <laughs> Looks like it, doesn't it? said Montgomery, and turned towards the wake again. Suddenly we heard a yelp and a volley of furious blasphemy from the companion hatchway, and the deformed man with the black face came up hurriedly, he was immediately followed by a heavy, red-haired man in a white cap. At the sight of the former, the staghounds, who had all tired of barking at me by this time, became furiously excited, howling and leaping against their chains. The black hesitated before them, and this gave the red-haired man time to come up with him and deliver a tremendous blow between the shoulder blades." The poor devil went down like a felled ox and rolled in the dirt among the furiously excited dogs. It was lucky for him that they were muzzled. The red-haired man gave a gop of exultation and stood staggering, and as it seemed to me in serious danger of either going backward down the companion hatchway or forward upon his victim. As soon as the second man had appeared, Montgomery had started forward. "'Steady on there,' he cried in a tone of remonstration. A couple of sailors appeared on the forecastle. The black-faced man, howling in a singular voice, rolled about under the feet of the dogs. No one attempted to help him. The brutes did their best, worrying him, butting their muzzles at him. There was a quick dance of their lithe, gray-figured bodies over the clumsy, prostrate figure. The sailors forward shouted as though it was an admirable sport." Montgomery gave an angry exclamation and went striding down the deck, and I followed him. The black man scrambled up and staggered forward, going and leaning over the bulkward of the main shrouds, where he remained, panting and glaring over his shoulder at the dogs. The red-headed man laughed a satisfied laugh. "'Look here, Captain,' said Montgomery, with his lisp a little accentuated, gripping the elbows of the red-haired man. "'This won't do.' I stood behind Montgomery. The captain came half round and regarded him with the dull, solemn eyes of a drunken man. What won't do, he said, 
and added after looking sleepily into Montgomery's face for a minute, Blasted sawbones. With a sudden movement, he shook his arm free and after two ineffectual attempts, stuck his freckled fist into his side pockets. That man's a passenger, said Montgomery. I'd advise you to keep your hands off him. Uh, go to hell, said the captain loudly. He suddenly turned and staggered towards the side. Do what I like on my own ship, he said. I think Montgomery might have left him then. Seeing the brute was drunk, but he only turned a shade pale and followed the captain to the bulkward. You look here, captain. That man of mine is not to be ill-treated. He has been hazed ever since he came aboard. For a minute, the alcoholic fumes kept the captain speechless. Blasted sawbones, was all he considered necessary. I could see that Montgomery had one of those slow, pernicious tempers that will warm day after day to a white heat and never again cool to forgiveness. And I saw, too, that this quarrel had been some time growing. The man's drunk, I said, perhaps officiously. He'll do no good. Montgomery gave an ugly twist to his dropping lip. He's always drunk. Do you think that excuses his assault of his passengers? My ship, began the captain, waving his hand unsteadily towards the cages. Was a clean ship. Look at it now. It was certainly anything but clean. Crew, continued the captain. Clean, respectable crew. You agreed to take the beasts. I wish I'd never set eyes on your infernal island. What the devil want beasts for an island like that? Then that man of yours understood he was a man. He's a lunatic. He had no business aft. You think the whole damn ship belongs to you? Your sailors began to haze the poor devil as soon as he came on board. That's just what he is. He's a devil, an ugly devil. My man can't stand him. I can't stand him. None of us can stand him. Nor you neither. Montgomery turned away. You leave that man alone anyhow, he said, nodding his head as he spoke. But the captain meant to quarrel now. He raised his voice. If he comes this end of the ship, I'll cut his insides out, I tell ya. Good as blasted insides. Who are you to tell me what I'm to do? I'll tell you I'm captain of this ship. Captain and owner. I'm the law here. I tell you, the law and the prophets. I bargained to take a man and his attendant to and from Arica and bring back some animals. I never bargained to carry a mad devil and a silly sawbones. Uh, well, never mind what he called Montgomery. I saw the latter take a step forward and interpose. He's drunk, I said. The captain began some abuse even fouler than the last. Shut up, I said, turning on him sharply, for I had seen danger in Montgomery's white face. With that, I brought the downpour on myself. However, I was glad to avert what was uncommonly near a scuffle. Even at the price of the captain's drunken ill will, I do not think I have ever heard quite so much vile language come in a continuous stream from any man's lips before, though I have frequented eccentric company enough. I found some of it hard to endure, though I am a mild-mannered man, but certainly... When I told the captain to shut up, I had forgotten I was merely a bit of human flotsam, cut off from my resources with my fare unpaid, a mere casual dependence on the bounty or speculative enterprise of the ship. He reminded me of it with considerable vigor, but at any rate, I prevented a fight. So quoth this raven... This is a very interesting story, I'm sure you all know. Any rate, darlings, have a wonderful, wonderful day.
Thank you for stopping by, my darlings. It means so much. I so enjoy telling these stories for you. And here are some of my marvelous supporters. Please, if you haven't subscribed, consider doing so. If you give this video a like, it would help me out ever so much. Thank you, and have a lovely, lovely day.